And then the other thing is trust. You know, when we trust people around us, and when we trust in God for his good medicine, it's good for our heart and it's good for our soul. And then stop unwelcome intrusion into your good health like, like certain problems that you can't handle that aren't yours. Getting over involved in other people's problems when it's when you're not a part of the solution. We need to let God take some of our burdens. And a great thing to do is prayer. Praying is one of the best things you can do for your mind. It helps stimulate your brain in many different ways. And persevering to making good changes in your life is very good. And it helps you to achieve mental health, physical health, and spiritual health. Let's read this, can we? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. This is Jesus. He wants to give us abundant life and he wants to see us healthy. He says that our bodies are his temple and he wants to have us feeling good and feeling safe and have the longest life that we can so that we can impact other people for him. So make sure that you're changing the things that you can about your lifestyle so that you can have the healthiest life possible. Father, we do so much thank you for this opportunity to come together to hear your word. We pray for the Holy Spirit to dwell amongst us, to open our hearts, to open our minds, that we can be blessed. And we know we will be blessed by your word. So we ask that you would guide Pastor Snaman as he brings your word to us. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening. Good evening. Nice to uh, be with you here in sunny Florida. My wife was driving on Sunday in Michigan. Cars sliding off the roads because of snow and accidents and all kinds of problems like that and you don't have a lot of that around here so that's really a good thing and uh, I'm glad here to be able to be with you today. I want to um, introduce you to my family just in case you wondered and uh, on the left is my son-in-law Kevin, my daughter Kristen in the middle. Next to my wife, our adopted son, Carlo, my mother-in-law, Shirley, and I don't know who the guy is on the right. <laughs> he looks a little bit like the guy in the picture on the brochure, but, um, and I'm not sure who Deborah was talking about when she was introducing those speakers. Did you know those people? Yeah. Well, anyway, my name is Royce, this is my wife, Lori, and we're really glad to be able to be with you today and uh, especially to share something I believe is really exciting. You see, this is the week, of course, that the thoughts of the Christian world are on the final events of the life of Christ, especially those which occurred on the last weekend, culminating in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. So this is a good time for us to review those events, don't you think? I think it's a good time for us to be able to look at this and be able to understand what the importance of those, uh, that experience was for us. Most Christians, though, do not realize that there is much more to know about these events that surrounded his first coming 
than simply recognizing that they happened. Most Christians just acknowledge that they happened. But by digging deeper into what the Bible says, we will see that the Bible also teaches us a lot about our own time and what Jesus wants us to know about his second coming. And you'll see how those are connected as we go along today. I've been a student of the Bible for 45 plus years, and the more I study the Bible, the more excited I am about understanding the Bible's special, special message for today. The Bible was written for us today. I hope to convince you of that tonight, and I think you will see it. Now, it may seem unusual to connect the events of the week of Christ's life with prophecy, but as you will see, it's not unusual at all, because Christ's life is the focus of prophecy, and He is the author of prophecy, and prophecy especially pointed to this event that the world remembers on this weekend, mm -hmm. the most important event in the history of this world is what the world remembers today with this weekend. We will also see that the Bible and all its events, including those of Christ's life, are very connected and intertwined from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. With only four sessions together, though, we have a problem. Our time can only be focused on a few short pieces of what the Bible has to say. I'm used to sharing a whole series of lectures of 25 or more series, but I have good news for you. Wow. I thought that was a plane landing for a moment, so I think we're okay. Um, I, I've got good news for you. You won't have 20 to 25 sessions. We can't get that all in this weekend. But we're going to give you four sessions where I think the lights have a chance to be able to come on and we'll get a good view of the big picture that the Bible has to share with us. We trust that you will be blessed by this special study and that you will see in the last days of the Passion Week, which was also refer is also referred to as Easter weekend, like you have never seen them before. A correct understanding of Bible prophecy will help the importance of these days of Christ's life to become clearer than you've ever seen them before. But it's time now to get away from the introduction and get to work. I would like to share some things with you that I hope you can then be the judge about how important they are for you. We're going to talk tonight about an amazing Bible prophecy that predicted Jesus' death. I'd like to start by going to the Bible in Matthew chapter 24. I hope you have a Bible. You didn't happen to bring one with you. There are some in the, in the back of the uh, pew in front of you, so you can help yourself to look through that. We'll also have texts up on the screen. That will help as well, but all of these will work together. The Bible is our lesson study book, our textbook for what we're going to do for the next four sessions, and as we do this, you will want to make sure you check up on me. If I'm saying the wrong thing, you can see it in the Bible because that's where we're going for our information. I want to start by looking at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. This is Jesus involved with his disciples. And this is what we find. The disciples, it says, one day he was sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these uh, things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? <clears throat> you have to put this picture in your mind. The disciples are sitting outside of the city of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, and they are looking toward Jerusalem and the magnificent temple that was up there. Now today, if you go to Jerusalem and you're outside, you're going to see a lot more because the city has grown up and been built up. But in those days, the city was walled, and in the center of, of the city was this magnificent temple built by King Herod. The Jews were very, very proud of that um, temple that was on the, uh, on the 
in the center of uh, Jerusalem. Jesus responded to the question that the disciples asked because they were looking at this and they had listened to what Jesus had said uh, and, and before this and, and they were impressed that if something were ever happen to the temple, because Jesus had talked about the fact that the temple would be destroyed, and when, when he said that, they understood it to be the temple that was up on the, up on the mountain there, and they, they decided it had to be the end of the world. So they asked him, when will these things be? When will the end of the world be? And in verse 15 of Matthew 24, Jesus said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and then it says, Whoever reads, let him understand. Now here's the interesting thing. Jesus, before he gives this it is piece of information, he tells them about what to expect at the end of the world. He talks to them about pestilences. He talks to them about all kinds of diseases. He talks about rumors of wars and wars and people claiming to be Christ himself and more and more. He talks about, sounds like the news of today is what it sounds like when you look at it. And then he comes here in verse 15 and he makes this statement. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. I want to take a few moments tonight to help you to see something that is easy to miss in a statement like this of Jesus. He zeroes in on the prophet Daniel. And there's something about the prophet Daniel and what Daniel said that's significant. The prophet Daniel has something important to say to you and to me. He had something to warn the disciples about. Also, it mentions here time. And we want to understand and recognize that time is important to God. I want to illustrate that this evening by looking at the verse we just read. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So first of all, clearly, he identifies Daniel as an important prophet to be paying attention to for the disciples. We'll see that it's also important for us, and you'll understand why. He also then says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation. With Jesus, time was important. So I want you to recognize that we learned two things from this passage tonight. The first is, Daniel has something to say that we want to understand. And secondly, time is important to God. You'll see just how important in just a moment. Now, if, if Daniel was important to Jesus, then it's important to me to understand what Daniel had to say. I want to go back and see what was it that Daniel said that was something that clued in to what Jesus was trying to share at that time. Now, I have to warn you that I'm really going to have to do a little thinking tonight. I hope that's okay. If you just came from work and you're worn out, I'm going to try to energize you a little bit and get your mind thinking. Because what we're going to look at in the next little while may seem a little challenging, but I want you not to worry about the details but I want you to get the big picture. The details can be reviewed later, but make sure you get the big picture because that's what's truly important. Now let's talk about Daniel for a moment. In case you've forgotten about Daniel, he was a, a Jew who was taken captive by the Babylonian king, king Nebuchadnezzar about 600 years before Christ. The king had attacked Jerusalem and brought back many of the finest young men to Babylon to be his servants and in some cases to be his, his advisors. He chose the smartest, the best looking. He chose those that were healthiest, strong in mind and body to be those who would be able to help him in many of the things that he needed to accomplish in his kingdom. The book of Daniel, written by this young man who was taken captive, has several key prophecies in them that relate to the time and events that are important when we consider the future of God's people. We want to look at 
two of those prophecies tonight. And this is where you need to fight fasten your seatbelts because these two prophecies are really important in helping us grasp what Jesus wants us to understand. Again, don't try, get, try to get all the details right. I'll try to help you more with that in the future. Let's go to Daniel right now, and I'll show you. This is going to be a big picture. We're going to dive right in. But go to the book of Daniel. Now, if you're trying to find the book of Daniel, it's about halfway in the middle of the Bible. You might turn, like I just did, to the book of Ezekiel, and then the next book is the book of Daniel. In Daniel, there are 12 chapters. We're going to look at the 8th chapter today. And I want you to see a verse that's here. Now, normally, I would take a long time, a whole hour, maybe two hours, to explain all of this prophecy and all that's in here. But I'm going to give you a couple of key pieces that will help you to be able to understand it more easily than you ever thought you could. But we're going to go right to verse 14. I want you to see something in verse 14 that Daniel says. It says, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. One night, Daniel had a vision. It was given to him by God. And in that vision, he saw some strange things. He saw some animals popping up in this vision. He saw an angel speaking to him. In this vision here in Daniel 8, the meaning is clearer and easier to understand than you might realize. I'd like you to look here, first of all, at verse 3. If you look at verse 3, it says, I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. You with me? You say he must have had a real nightmare. Because the next thing he sees in verse 4, the ram pushing westward, northward, and uh, southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And then we see in verse 5, And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now you're saying, what in the world are we talking about? Here we have this vision, and he sees a ram, and he sees a goat. Now you and I could sit, I could come down here, for example, and we could start having a discussion. And I could ask you the question, so what do you think the ram was? Was the ram, was it some football team? Um, what's this goat? Is this, you know, what does it represent? Is it represent anything? I don't understand what this is. Now you and I could have this discussion, you could give me a guess, and we could have, everybody could have a different guess, because that's probably what would happen. But I've got good news for you. The Bible gives us the answer. I don't have to guess. And that's a good principle for understanding these kinds of things in the Bible. The first thing to do is see if the Bible gives us the answer. And I don't have to get complicated because I look right here in this passage and I find that there is a solution because, you see, Daniel himself was also a little bit confused. He was trying to figure out what was going on. What I want you to notice, first of all, and I'll come back to those animals in a moment, is that in this passage, it talks about an event. Do you see that? The event is the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So you see it's talking about a sanctuary. We're going to understand what that means also in just a moment. The sanctuary had to do with the event. Actually, I need to go back here for a moment. I want to review this uh, animals with you first. I thought it was coming later, but no, it's not. Look at verse... Verse 16. I want you to realize that Daniel didn't understand the vision either. And so God 
sent him an angel to explain it to him. If you look in verse 16, it says, I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uline, which was a river, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. See, God wanted him to understand it, so he sent the angel Gabriel to explain it to him. So he came near where I stood in verse 17, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face, but he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. You notice the word time? Then he says, um, the ram in verse 20, which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Medea and Persia. And he says then in verse 21, the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Here's the key. We can't go into all the details tonight. But those animals represented kingdoms, actual real kingdoms in history. Nothing confusing. Daniel lived in the days of Babylon. The next historical kingdom to follow was Medo Persia. Historically, we know that after Medo Persia came along Greece. Now, Medo Persia, for those of you who are wondering where this is in Persia, we would call Persia today Iran. So it was over in that part of the world, where Babylon was as well. Those kingdoms were being referred to in this vision, and what God was trying to help Daniel to understand is that God, he said, it was being told, God's in charge of time. God's in charge of history even before it happens. And he wanted Daniel to understand this because he wanted it to be given to God's people along the way to help them to understand something about the time of the end, to know something about the time of the end. How would you like to know something about the time of the end? I, I want to know about the time of the end, because the Bible does a lot, to, has a lot to say about the time of the end, and that's what you and I want to see here. Well, tonight, let's catch a few of these pieces. So first of all, we talked about the fact that there is time here, and there's an event. There's 2,300 days, and then it says the sanctuary will be cleansed. I want you to get the overall big picture. Time and event. Sanctuary being cleansed, time 2,300 days. Try not to bog down the details, but I have to give you a few of them to make sense. First of all, what's the sanctuary? You're saying, what's the sanctuary? Well, the sanctuary was very important to the Jews. Remember I said the temple in Jerusalem was very important to the Jews? Well, the temple was the sanctuary. But originally, when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, God said, build me a sanctuary. That's what he says here. Make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Very simply, this was a teaching tool that God wanted to use to teach His people about the plan of salvation. Now let me illustrate that for you right now. The sanctuary was a tent-like structure very similar to what you see here. The best concept, conception, conception that an artist can draw. The sanctuary was in the center of the camp of the children of Israel. It had a curtain all the way around, keeping people from just wandering through. And there was a good reason for that. We won't go into all those details. And inside the sanctuary, outer court, uh, which is what this outer court area was around here, were two articles of furniture. One was a, uh, an altar, a burnt sacrifice. The other was a laver of water. Then there was the sanctuary building itself, and it had two apartments. One was the holy place, the other was the most holy place. There were three articles of furniture here, candlesticks, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread, and here was the altar in the most holy place. I can't go into all the details now, but I'm going to give you a quick outline of what this taught the children of Israel. When a man or a woman sinned, in order for them to help them understand what the plan of salvation was, Jesus taught them through this practice 
of killing a lamb. It started in the Garden of Eden after sin. Remember Abel and his brother got in a fight because Abel was going to, did offer a lamb and, and uh, his brother Cain thought he didn't have to offer a lamb. So it started way back there. He would bring a lamb, if he, a sinner would bring a lamb to the sanctuary. The sanctuary would be, the uh, in the sanctuary, the lamb would be slain. I know that's gross and we don't like those kinds of things today. But you know what? Sin is gross and the death of Jesus is gross. Amen. And that's what he was trying to illustrate is how bad sin was. It causes death. That's what they were trying to, Jesus was trying to illustrate. So they would have to, the sinner would have to kill a lamb to, in order to re receive forgiveness from his sin. Now let me tell you what. If you had to go and kill a lamb every time you sin, I had to kill a lamb every time I sin, you and I would be a little more hesitant to go out and sin and just simply be bold and it doesn't really matter and it doesn't care. We don't care. By doing this, the sinner, uh, sinner's guilt was symbolically transferred to that perfect lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. In other words, it couldn't have a bad leg or it, it couldn't have a blind eye or anything like that because it represented Jesus, the perfect sacrifice for sinners like you and like me. This took place every day. Sinners would come and go. They didn't come all the time, but when something significant happened in their lives, they would bring the lamb and they would offer it there. The lamb would be burnt on the altar of sacrifice. The blood would be taken into the most I mean, into the holy place and would be sprinkled in here. There's a lot more symbolism that I can't take the time tonight to share with you. That was what happened every day, representing the death and the ministry and death of Jesus on behalf of sinners. Once a year, I'll just tell you this briefly and then we must move on. Once a year, the priest would go into the most holy place of the sanctuary. If I can back up here. Into the most holy place where the altar or the, the uh, ark of God was. Inside was the uh, tables of stone with the Ten Commandment law on it. Was a rod that had uh, budded miraculously and manna which was the special food that God gave the children of Israel while they were uh, wandering through the wilderness. In this sanctuary service on that day it was recognized as a the day of atonement or the day of judgment or a cleansing of the sanctuary. Now just kind of file that away because we don't have time to go into that tonight. The bottom line is this service took place daily, and then the other service once a year, and it centered around what was happening there in the sanctuary, was a lesson teaching God's people about the plan of salvation. The main point tonight is this. This whole prophecy was given in Daniel to establish the actual time when Jesus would come the first time to be our sacrifice for sin. You catch that? The main thing I want you to realize tonight is the time was given in this 2300 day prophecy as a way of telling the people when the Messiah would come in actual time. In order for you to believe me, I need to tell you the rest of the prophecy. So here we go. Got your seatbelts on? First of all, in Daniel chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, when Gabriel came and told the vision to Daniel, he came near to where he was standing, and he said, this vision refers to the end of time. Again, I want you to notice that the prophecy has to do with time. Time is important here. I want you to also think about, it says it's 2300 days. Now some people in interpreting the Bible, in Daniel chapter 8 uh, especially, have said this is 2300 days. Well, 2300 days comes out to about six years. I 
there's one problem with that. The problem is that it says it's the time of the end. The time of the end did not happen in six years. The time of the end, according to the Bible, is still future. So if the Bible is talking about 2,300 days, and, and we think that's six years, then we've got something wrong. Well, there's a simple answer to it. The Bible, again, gives us that answer. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 4,